Howdy, Tri-State. So uh, I visited a temple this past week, uh, more than once actually, and uh, I park, parked my car and uh, proceeded up the walk and I entered like the outer courts and I went into more the, the inner recesses of the temple and I, I went there to secure my, my blessing. And uh, I, I went from, from there through the, the inner recesses and I proceeded further um, into sort of the, the Holy of Holies, um, where I, I approached the altar, and there with the assistance of, of the priest, um, I laid down my sacrifice, and with sort of a, a series of codes, uh, one of which was 4011, um, I, I managed to secure my blessing, and, and I could leave there and, and then um, not return until about a week later. Uh, I went to the supermarket, the outer courts, of course, were sort of the, the vestibule you first walk in with the sliding doors, and the, the recesses, of course, were the various aisles and the produce section, and, and the, the Holy of Holies, of course, was the checkout counter. The priest uh, was, was a young lady with a name tag that said trainee, um, and, and the codes were all the barcodes, and, and 4011 is the code for bananas. You put them on the scale or whatever, um, and I, I secured my, my blessing of groceries, and I could leave there for the week. We, we have in our, in our world a whole series of codified rituals that we all go through. And we could probably do the same exact story with just about anything that we do on a regular basis, whether it's grocery shopping or the temple and the altar of the shopping mall where we lay down our sacrifice in the form of Visa or MasterCard. And we secure the things that, that we find valuable or we find necessary. Or if you go to the sports stadium and you go through the series of rituals and liturgies and performances and the way that you express and form your love for your team and the way that you worship at, at the altar of um, organized sports or consumerism or what have you and, and the various signs and liturgies and rituals that we have around us form sort of our, sort of our cultural religion um, that, that helps, under, helps us understand b basically um, a, a very basic set of questions. So, so all rituals will answer the questions of who we are, where we've been, and where we're going. They, they help kind of frame our identity. Like we, we understand ourselves through the lens of these various codified rituals. The gym is a very obvious example of this. And it, like, if you're into like the whole CrossFit thing, there's a whole series of like some some are actually like really bizarre types of rituals. Like you've seen like the folks who like like push tractor tires around and, and stuff like that. Um, they got lost in like the like the farm goods store, I guess, and this not like a good idea. But but by going through those different rituals, it tells them something about who they are, what they like to be in terms of their fitness regime. And there's usually some type of priest or fitness trainer. Kind of, kind of directing the whole process and kind of influencing the way that they, they literally shape themselves um, both outside as well as inside. And so we were talking the past few weeks about why church, why do we do church? Uh, we looked at the last week about why we do worship and the way that everyone worships something. And this week we're interested in talking about the whole idea of why ritual. Like why do we perform particular acts why does the church in particular perform specific things and rites and these codified practices? Why do we do that? And why, are, why do we do the ones that are so common? And just spoiler alert, like we're, we're, we're looking specifically at, at two um, this morning, specifically baptism and communion or the Lord's table. So we're going to look at just the whole idea of why we perform these things and, and what they, what they kind of mean for us. Um, it, First things first, um, let, let's first recognize and just admit that these rituals, um, baptism and Lord's table in particular, um, are practiced in a variety of different ways by a variety of different churches. And, and so I was even struck this past week looking at a few um, just commentaries and books and things like that at, at how, how often it's really easy to move from the Bible to church tradition and to, to anchor ourselves with any particular framework that we had grown up with rather than really looking at what the Bible has to say. So we'll, we'll talk briefly about some church tradition this morning, 
but I want to spend most of our time kind of pouring over a whole series of verses that help frame our understanding of, of what these rituals are and what they do for us. Um, so, so, so before we even do any of that, I, I, I want to make sure that we understand very basically um, how all ritual kind of plays into the life of a believer. Okay, so, so like in Ephesians chapter, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says this, it says that for, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Like there's no room for superiority or inferiority based on the rituals we perform. Like the, nothing about the ritual itself offers salvation. Like the, the rich, doing the ritual, doing baptism or communion do, does not in themselves um, offer us anything in terms of God's saving grace. God approves of you only through the death of his son and, and that his blood now covers us and that our reputation is Jesus' reputation so that when Jesus looks at us, he sees not broken sinners, but he sees the, the goodness and cleanliness of his son. However, there are some rituals that we're actually commanded to perform. So, so some might take, you know, baptism as, as a way of, of saying, listen, I'm, I'm saved through baptism. Peter contradicts this. He says this, he says, corresponding to that, Noah and his family saved through the flood in the ark. Baptism now saves you, wait a minute, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he, said, okay, he says, baptism now saves you, but then he, he clarifies, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience. It's, it's God who reaches into your life. It's God who purifies. It's God who saves you. Like the rituals that we do are, as we'll see this morning, emblematic. They, they symbolize what God is doing in your life. They are not the thing that saves you. So, so why do them at all? First John says this, it says, The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him, but whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. In other words, that if, if we claim to follow Jesus, we do these things, we follow Jesus' commandments, and, and we do two in particular, as I mentioned. We do baptism and we do communion. Um, those, those are things that Jesus commanded his church to go do. So, so those two things really form sort of the, the core identity of who we are as a church. Y yes, there are many, many things that we might do as forms of, of rituals and forms of activities and forms of practices. But the things that Jesus really saw as sort of defining who his people would be um, were, were these two things in particular. So, so in Matthew chapter 28, when Jesus is, is departing from his, his followers, he says this. He says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So even, even when Jesus gives sort of the, the mission or the marching orders of the church, he anchors it in the story of baptism and the command to go, go do that. Like, go, go baptize people. So, so here's what we'll do this morning. Let's look very briefly at the way that baptism has been understood throughout history, and then let's kind of like un unpack that and, and look at what the Bible says about this particular practice. In the earliest days of the church, um, people were baptized when they came to know Jesus. But over time, or somewhere around the fourth century or so, um, we started seeing baptism take this whole new approach where they started baptizing babies, children, um, because they believe that baptism in some way um, washes you clean from original sin. Uh, and so that, that practice fundamentally stuck for um, a very, very long time, um, so over a thousand years. It, it wasn't really until the Reformation came along uh, 1517, Martin Luther started this whole new new program called the Protestant Church, um, and 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 they started looking at things differently. Now, now Luther himself did not move far beyond this. Um, Lu Luther would say, "Listen, it it 
it does purify you from your original sin. However, that, that only matters if you later in life make an actual confession of faith. Other folks around that same time said, okay, hold on, listen. Um, it, it's not really about purifying us from original sin. It's more about, it's, it's more like, like circumcision in the Old Testament. So we, we baptize our children um, so that they can be included in the, in the, the family of faith and the church. And we, we baptize our children as sort of a, a way of, of getting in the door. Um, still, still later, there were others who said, no, no, we're, we're not baptizing children at all. We're, we're only baptizing adults. And there are basically two ways of looking at this. One is to sort of retain some of the language from the Bible of, of keeping God's commands and, and then saying, baptism actually confers salvation on you in some way. In other words, you, you can't be saved unless you are baptized. And, and then there are others who take more of a symbolic approach and they say that ba baptism basically just identifies you with Christ and his church. So, so the, the point that I'm trying to kind of draw out here is, is several, actually. Um, first, there's a very, like, there's a, there's a plurality of ways that baptism is, is practiced in the church. Like, let's, let's at least acknowledge that. Um, let's not ignore tradition, um, but let's not let it dominate either. And I was just, I was just mentioning earlier, like, I was, I was struck by the ways that some in some of these other traditions appeal not directly to scripture, but to their church governing documents and to their church founding statements. And, and, and I think that we, we can move beyond that, or at least we can, we can go behind that and look at what the Bible really says. If we look at this chart again, what, what we see is that, okay, there's, there's children and there's adults. If, when children are baptized, it's usually because we're looking not, not to their future. We're looking more at the past. And so our, our arrow points to past tradition. It points to the faith of the parents. It points to the faith of the community. Um, whereas when we, uh, when we baptize adults, we're, we're typically looking at their faith, we're looking at, at their life moving forward. We're looking at what they will experience as they, they follow Jesus. Um, so let's, let's look very briefly at what the Bible says uh, about the practice of, of baptism. Um, just, just gonna, just gonna you know, telegraph the punch right from the start. Um, I'm, I'm gonna argue this morning that our that fourth position is the one that we're gonna move towards, that, that baptism doesn't save you. Baptism is explicitly a, a symbol for those who have already come to follow Jesus. It's a way of publicly declaring your faith to, to the world that, yes, um, I, I am now following Jesus. Again, it does not confer salvation. It, it declares, it symbolizes your salvation. And I think as we move through the Bible here this morning, um, we'll, we'll see a lot of that. Um, if you're a note taker, you can just scribble down some of these verse references and, and look them up at your leisure. Um, Acts chapter 2, we see the church actually putting this Jesus command into practice. It says that those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Some translations actually use the word those who believed were baptized, and there were added that day 3,000 souls. So we see that, that reception of the word, that belief um, precedes baptism. It's, it's not that you get baptized, and, and, and that's what saves you. But mo moving on, Acts chapter 8, verse 12 says this. This is Philip. It says that when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. L later, Philip also, uh, the story of the Ethiopian eunuch, you know that story. Um, Philip, Philip, in some mysterious way, um, encounters this, this eunuch who's riding in this like chariot, um, and, he, and he overhears the guy reading from the Old Testament, because they read out loud that back then. And Philip asked the guy, do you, do you understand what you're reading? And, and the guy in the chariot says, says no, I don't, I don't get it. And so Philip like, un helps him unpack that passage and connect it to Jesus. And so, Philip, and so Philip just preaches the gospel to this guy, and the guy um, believes. So verse 35 of Acts chapter 8 says this. It says that Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the, the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? 
And, and then if you have an English Bible, some of your translations actually add a verse, and they add the verse, um, so, something along the lines is, as long as you believe, and, and the eunuch again confesses his faith, yes, I believe. That, that was probably not original to the book of Acts, but the fact that they, they added it in, um, in a, a short time later helps us understand that, yes, they, they did, in fact, believe that baptism um, came after belief. It came as a symbol following your conversion, not as a part of your conversion. And it says, verse 38, he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. We could keep going on with several other passages in Acts, but they, they all kind of revolve around this basic theme. So what I want you to see is sort of the, the forms of baptism that we see in the New Testament are, are basically threefold. First, baptism symbolizes salvation. It doesn't, again, it does not confer salvation. It is a symbol of salvation. I, I can't repeat that enough this morning. Um, it symbolizes that new relationship that person has with Jesus Christ. It's, it's a little weirder to us because back then, um, their, their conversion and their baptism were like the same like moment, like the same day. Like they, they, they got it done all at once. Um, in, in, our, in our day and age, thanks to primarily to sort of the, the revivalism of the past few centuries, um, there's been more of an emphasis on, on altar calls um, and sinners' prayers, and we, we've actually separated the, the practice of baptism from conversion so that usually we, we, you know, we choose to follow Jesus, and that at some point later, we, we choose to get baptized. Um, not, nothing wrong with that. Um, it, it's just that we, we've turned baptism into sort of a rite of passage, sort of a, a mark of maturity, ra rather than the, the initial declaration of your own salvation. Um, it, there's a degree to which that's okay. Um, I, I myself was not baptized until literally the, the day before I left to go to seminary. Uh, got baptized, uh, blocked my keys in the car. Um, it was a great day. Um, but, but, but often we, we look at baptism as a way of, of sort of marking the next step in our journey, whereas in the New Testament, that's not the way that was practiced. It was more of the immediate, I, I'm following Jesus now, why not declare it through this whole water baptism thing? Um, secondly, this is sort of a, a, a follow-up of that, that baptism is therefore only for believers. Um, I, I don't think that leaves us any room for baptizing um, young children, or, or at least children who are not expressing their faith. Uh, like, it's not uncommon for a lot of parents to think, listen, I, I want to make sure that my kid gets baptized, um, and, 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 like, the kid doesn't really get hardly anything, and you start realizing that the baptism for that, for that child is less about that child's faith, but again, more, more about looking back to the faith of the parents and the faith of the family. And that's, that's just not what New Testament fundamentally teaches. Um, third, baptism, baptism is usually performed by immersion. Um, even the word baptizo means to immerse. Um, can also be used, I, of all things, to, to drown. Um, there, there's an element to baptism of actually being put under the water. Um, it, it wasn't until a little bit later that the like, early followers of Jesus in the early church um, put together a work called the Didache, meaning the teaching, and they, they clarified, listen, if you, if you absolutely can't find water, um, pouring like a small amount of water would, would be okay. Again, they're appealing to the symbolic nature of this. Um, if you're a really good Baptist, you would say none of that, um, only under the water. But again, if, if the, the early followers of Jesus were so committed to making sure that baptism and conversion happened almost at the same moment, that they, they wanted it to happen as soon as they possibly could, like not, not waiting until they got to the Y with the pool, right? But, but just pulling out their canteen or whatever they had in that day and, and making that happen right then and there. Um, so, so baptism then, um, the under the water part helps us understand a little bit more about the specific symbolic meaning behind baptism and what that symbol actually does. And, and our clarifying text for that comes to us from the book of Romans, Romans chapter 6. Um, at this point in Romans, he's, he's moved on for talking about 
you know, move from the basics of the gospel to how we live out the gospel. And he says this in chapter 6, verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Paul's kind of appealing to the whole tradition of being like immersed or being dunked. The whole, the whole language here is that in baptism, when you're immersed, when you go under the water, it symbolizes you basically dying. And when you come out, it symbolizes you being raised to life again. Just as you have died with Christ, you are being raised with Christ. Your life is now in Christ. There is a radical unity with Christ so that that baptism, that moment, symbolizes the way that you have experienced that in your life, sort of that, that once once that one-time moment that you chose to follow after him. Now, now they didn't bury people quite the same way that, that we get buried today. So the, the symbolism is very general, the idea of going, going under and coming back up. But the symbolism is still very, very clear. That, that when we are baptized, we are symbolically saying, I am dead to my old self, and I'm being raised to my new self by having that life in Christ. So, so baptism as a definition is it's an outward symbol of personal faith. It's an outward symbol of personal faith. It symbolizes our repentance from our sin, our old, old self, and it's a symbol of that salvation that we receive, the resurrection, that new life in him, and it identifies us with Christ, and it identifies us with Christ's church. So when we, when we get baptized, we're, we're talking about, again, just a very basic symbol of what, what Christ has already done in our lives. The most common illustration of this is, of course, the wedding rings. Like, if you're here this morning and, you, and you're married and you've got your wedding ring on, um, if you're married, you don't have your wedding ring on, that, that's maybe a problem for you. You just talk to your wife about that um, or see Tim when he gets back. Um, the, the, wedding, the wedding ring, um, that, that doesn't actually marry you. Like, if you took your ring off and handed it to someone around you, and had them put it on, it'd be weird, but it wouldn't change the relationship, right? Um, the ring that you're wearing is a symbol of the commitment that you, you made at that altar. Like you exchange those rings as a symbol of what of the love that you share as a couple. And so too does baptism represent a symbol of what Christ has done in your life and you're, you're choosing to follow after him. Now, now, just in case you might think, if it's just a symbol, why practice it at all? Um, imagine if, it's someone's, if you're at someone's wedding and you're in charge of the rings, and you, and you lose one, and you say to that bride, listen, I, I've lost the rings, but don't worry, it's just a symbol. When you regain consciousness, let me know how that works out for you. The point is that, that when we participate in these things, it's what Frederick Buchner said, that we're, we're playing make-believe. And he didn't say that to, to lighten the, the significance of what we're doing. He's saying that we're actually playing make-believe. We're, we're, we're actually entering into God's story. When we get together for, for things like Bible study, we're, we're, of course, you know, telling the story of God. But when we do things like baptism, we're, we're fundamentally entering into that, that story. We're, we're now expressing our participation in that story, and we're expressing our love for what God has done for us. There's a second way we do that with communion, with the Lord's table. So why communion? Um, I, th three things, very simply. For, first, um, it retells the story of redemption. Um, it retells the story from beginning to end. Um, so, so in Luke chapter 22, um, it says this, is that then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare this Passover for us that we may eat it. So communion finds its, its roots not in the New Testament itself, but rather in the redemptive story of the Old Testament. And we're really seeing what I'm going to call a U-shaped story, where the story really begins at sort of the, the top with, with the Exodus 
um, and we see the Passover being practiced. And the whole significance here was that the, 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 the night that Exodus, I'm sorry, that Israel was released from captivity in Egypt, um, it, they were spared from God's wrath by anointing their, their doors with, with the blood of a lamb. They gathered together to celebrate a meal together, and after that they escaped from slavery through the mighty act of God. And ever since that time, up until the time of Jesus here in the upper room, they would gather yearly to celebrate the Passover, and they would take these various elements of the Passover as a way of expressing, this is what God has done for us, this is who we were as slaves, this is who we are as God's chosen people, and this is where we're going as, as people who are going to possess and inhabit God's chosen land. And all of the elements of Passover, that Passover celebration, told that story in about a hundred different ways. So, so they, would, they would share together things like bitter herbs to remind themselves of, of the bitterness of being in captivity. Um, they would often eat the meal while, while reclining, like laying on their sides, to, because that symbolized their, their new status as free people. And they would take all these different things, and even, even the bread, the unleavened bread, the, the reason they didn't use yeast um, was because they had to leave very quickly. And they believe that, that God's redemption happened quickly. And so we, we retained at least some of these things in our communion celebration because now God is announcing this new exodus from the cross onward that we're now celebrating. So here in the upper room, Jesus says this, or Luke writes this, um, chapter 22, verse 14 says, When the hour came, he reclined at table, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So several, several things here, kind of as a sub-point. We're telling this whole larger story of redemption. Um, it, now, from, from the cross onward, we, we celebrate the same Passover meal, just in a different way, with a different focus. Now, now our, our goal, where we're going, is, is the new covenant, this new kingdom of God that comes at his return, where we celebrate in some way or another this, this wedding celebration of the Lamb, the wedding supper of the Lamb. And so between the cross and that day, we celebrate communion, we celebrate the Lord's table, and we retain the elements of the bread and cup. Why? Because Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. So we, we f fulfill this as a way of, of saying, listen, this is, this is who we are, this is who we've been, this is where we're going. Who we are is adopted sons of God. Who we've been are those who lived under the yoke of slavery of sin. And where we're going is God's glorious future kingdom that comes when he sets all things new again. Like we're, we're telling that story every time we take these elements together. Secondly, communion unifies us as a church. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16 and 17 says this, The cup of blessing that we bless... Is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The, bl the bread that we break is it not a participation in the body of Christ. Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Um, Randy covered this really well a few weeks ago about why gather. Um, in, in the New Testament, like the primary focus of church was not singing songs. It wasn't to come hear a sermon. It wasn't even really a social thing. It was, it was the primary thing of gathering together to celebrate this meal, this table. This is what really matters to us as a community. Why? Again, because that, that table symbolizes and it tells that story of redemption. It tells the reason why they're there. Third, um, it anticipates Christ's return. 
And I already mentioned the whole deal of the wedding supper of, of the Lamb, but, but Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 11, that for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was, when he was betrayed took, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So Paul is continuing this tradition of saying we're going to obey Jesus by doing this in his remembrance. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So when we, when we gather at these tables, then, we're, we're also anticipating that day when we finally get where we're going. Like, we're anticipating that day when we have that, that amazing wedding supper of the Lamb, when all things are set right, Christ is, is refashioning the world in a way that is made new and perfect and glorious and beautiful. So when we celebrate communion then, it's a little bit like, like if you've been in a wedding before, um, like the wedding happens on, say, Saturday, but then Friday evening you gather and you kind of go through the motions and you rehearse, and then you share a meal together. And it's, it's not the same meal that you're having the next day. Um, my, my favorite, like, like wedding supper, like wedding rehearsal dinner was at Bojangles uh, Fried Chicken down south, right? But you're, you're sharing a meal together. You're sharing, the re you're sharing what we call the rehearsal dinner. And in a lot of ways, that's what the communion celebration really is. It's a rehearsal dinner before the day that we finally experience that, that true and glorious wedding supper of the Lamb when God eliminates all, all the sin, all the tears, all the death, and that we can share that communion together in his new glorious kingdom. So, so communion is about all, all of those things kind of, kind of put together. But then, but then Paul kind of sears the conversation here in the church in Corinth um, in a slightly darker way. He says this, and whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the, of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. There's some strong language here. Paul's conveying that, at least in, in the Corinthian setting, there have been people who have actually like, experienced really bad stuff by approaching the communion tables in an unworthy manner. And I think that can be true of all of us even today. And I remember when I was growing up, like this was often kind of beaten into us when we took communion. Um, it, or, or maybe even you've shared that experience where like, you, you're about to take communion and, and this verse is trotted out and, and we're expected to sort of bow our heads and close our eyes. And what we often do is we, we kind of take inventory and say, okay, what, what have I done in the last, you know, two weeks since I took communion? Okay, I did that, this, that, this, and that. I, I definitely did that. Um, so you, you better, like, confess right now and pray real hard so that, like, you, you can make yourself, like, you can, you can work yourself sorry enough that you, you feel, like, sad enough that now you can take communion together. And, and that's often what I've, I've kind of interpreted communion to be like. Um, I, think, I think unworthy manner means that we, we place ourselves outside of that redemptive story. And, and I think we do that in two ways. Um, the first way is to take our sin too lightly. And we take our, but specifically by taking our, taking our sin too lightly by ignoring those things that separate us from God, ignoring the things and the ways that we place our love for things um, ahead of our love for the Savior, whether that's through our greed, through our, our lust, whatever it may be, and say, listen, not a big deal. We all make mistakes. I'm going to approach the table anyway. So we can take our sin too lightly, or, or we take our sin too lightly by, by thinking that as long as we pray real hard— and we feel sad enough that, that we have made ourselves in some way worthy of that table. If we're religious enough that we, we come to that table because now, now we deserve it. Like now, now we are men and women who are worthy of taking that bread and that cup. And both of those approaches are, are wrong. 
this table is, is not for the put together. This table is not for those who dismiss their sin. This table is for those who recognize their own brokenness. And they come to that table, they come to that altar, and, and they come knowing exactly who they've been. They come knowing that who, this is who I now am in Christ, and this is now where I'm going in Jesus. That's why we need these rituals in our lives, folks. Because, like I mentioned earlier, there's, there's all kinds of rituals and all kinds of stuff in our lives today that helps us answer those three questions in a really wrong way. If you, if you worship at the altar of consumerism, then you, you believe that you can shape your identity through what you buy or what you work hard to achieve. Um, if you worship at the altar of lust, then there's a danger that you can, you can see yourself as shameful and broken and wholly unworthy of anyone's love, including God's. So we, we, our identity might be elevated because we think that we've, we've made it, it might be in the dirt because we think that we've sinned so far we can't possibly dig ourselves out of that pit. Communion ta- the communion table is for you. It's for all of us. It's for all of us to recognize that we have a new identity, that we are not looked at through the lens of our achievements nor through our scandalous shame. We, we who follow Jesus are looked at through the lens of, of the love that comes from God, looking at us as if we are his son, and, and looking at us, recognizing that this is now the new community that I have formed and I am raising. This table is for all of us. It, so, so there's a very real sense in which it, it doesn't matter what we've done or who we've been in, in the week, the day, or even the hour before we come to this altar. And, and I don't mean that we take ourselves too, too lightly or take our sin flippantly. I'm saying that we, we come to this altar recognizing that there is nothing that I can bring here that will equal the sacrifice already made for me and, and now symbolized in the broken bread, symbolizing the broken body, and the cup, the symbolizing the bloodshed, that I come to those things recognizing this is what God has done for me. That though I am broken, Jesus was broken so that I could be made whole. Though, though I am deserving of God's ferocious, holy, righteous anger, instead of demanding my blood, he offers his own. So what, what we're going to do this morning is, is um, twofold, really, to return to the baptism thing for, for a moment. Um, if some of you have not taken that step to, to obey Jesus in a public declaration of your faith through baptism, um, send us an email, come see one of us on staff, we will make that happen. We often do it um, at the creek, or the crick, rather, um, in the summertime, right? We have a great time out there doing that. Like we, we will make that happen for you. Um, and even if you can't make that particular date, we've, we've often like done sort of smaller, more sort of private gatherings. And we, we've made that happen for, for folks here. We will make that happen for you. But secondly, as the, as the band comes forward this morning, um, there, there are multiple tables around the room, and, and we often, we, we celebrate this on a pretty regular basis around here, but we invite you to gather with your family, with friends, those of you who follow Jesus. We invite you to come together to celebrate your place in that story, that we, we are, in fact, playing, playing make-believe a little bit in, in recognizing that the elements before us represent something Perform not by us, but for us. That we are not worthy of this table, but Jesus invites us anyway. That we gather around not to celebrate how great we are, but to reflect on how bad we are and how great Jesus is. And that because of what he has done for us, that we are raised to the Lord's table, that we can share in in his blessed kingdom only by his grace and only by his love. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful for the chance to partake in these different rituals that you have given us, um, that we can recognize our own place in this larger story. Lord, I pray that as we gather together to take communion, take this table together, that when we break the bread and we take the cup, that we recognize um, exactly what this table means, that we 
um, are coming not because of some other empty ritual, not some other thing to do, but rather because we're looking at um, your, your story, your, your sending of your son, that um, he would take my place, he would take our place, and uh, because he, he was brought low, we can be raised up, and that we can um, enjoy the blessings of your kingdom as a result of that. Lord, I ask that if your spirit, that your spirit just be active, um, both this morning as well as in the week ahead or even the weeks ahead, that maybe those who have not taken a step of faith as of yet would do so, um, or even those who have already taken that step and not taken the step of obedience through baptism would do so, and that we um, would just celebrate what you've done for us um, through these actions. As we come to the time of tables this morning, I just ask that you bless our time together and uh, just bless our worship this morning, Lord. In your Son's beautiful name and by your Spirit's power, amen.